Okay, this is the audio review for Persistence of Gender Inequality in Employment Settings by Cecilia Ridgway. So first she talks about gender hierarchy, which is just a system of social practices that advantage men over women in material resources, status, power, authority, all those fun things. And she talks about how gender hierarchy has persisted in Western societies despite profound changes in economic arrangements, which are closely related to this unequal structure. So it's persisted through um, industrialization, through the movement of women into the workforce, and even of women into male-dominated positions. So her question is, why does it persist, right? So one reason is how gender hierarchy is economic, and another is how social arrangements are mediated by interactional processes that we largely take for granted that are organized around our stereotypes related to gender. So she argues that, you know, gender processes take place as people are interacting in their economic and other lives, and they can operate as, you know, a sort of invisible hand that rewrites gender inequality into new social arrangements as they replace the earlier arrangements that gender hierarchy was originally based on. That's why it keeps persisting, because it keeps kind of being reborn. So she talks about how gender is an organizing principle in interaction, right? It's something that we read from another's performance to gauge how we're expected to interact with that person. And this can cause a lot of confusion for people if the person is non-binary in some way. Uh, we have a hard time because we need to classify them so we know how to interact with them. So an example she gives of that is um, the, <laughs> the, the sketch um, It's Pat from SNL, which I included a clip in here. I'm going to throw that in here for you. Um, so you get a little taste of that because most of you are probably too young to remember this. But um, really, it just points out that the difficulty of dealing with a person whose gender is ambiguous, this just suggests that gender categorization is really a first step in our cultural rules about how we're supposed to treat people, how we're supposed to interact. We use those kind of scripts for organizing our interactions. So to interact, we classify a person in relation to ourselves in socially meaningful ways so that we can draw on our cultural knowledge about how people like that are likely to behave, right? And how we're supposed to act in return. So we have social rules for categorizing ourselves and social rules for categorizing others, but these things have to be simplified so they can happen easily in interactions. So it's apparently obvious that they provide easy means for initially defining people so interactions can take place at all. And these cultural rules for men and women are very quick resources in our interaction that fulfill these kind of, you know, our stereotypes basically fill in the void of us having to understand who this person is. We rely on them to teach us who this person is. So the cognitive processes by which we perceive others are also hierarchically organized. So not just through gender, right? Obviously through race, through class, through all sorts of other things. We have uh, social hierarchies that define some people as more worthy, more credible. And in the case of economic resources, um, you know, more entitled to the financial rewards of a job or, you know, um, better suited to be in leadership or whatever it might be. So workplaces themselves often have clear social scripts that define who you are in the space, who others are, and they frame interactions such as, you know, um, the interaction between a worker and a boss. Depending on which one of those two people you are, you're going to act differently. Bosses have more power and status. They're higher in a hierarchy. So they're able to kind of wield that power and that's going to shape the interaction itself, right? Between a worker and a boss versus between a worker and another worker or between a boss and another boss, right? So um, gender categorization also continues as this is happening at work because the processes of enacting a social script has these concrete, you know, gender expectations imbued with them. So it's not just a matter of worker and boss, it's, you know, maybe male worker, female boss, or female worker, male boss, or, you know, male worker, male boss, that those things also matter, that those things also come to inform how these interactions take place, um, and really kind of our expectations of the, the performance of work itself. So, you know, the understanding in a role can change depending on the gender of the actors. So sometimes we have ungendered scripts for how things work, like how a worker interaction should take place before a boss or, you know, with an educational institution, how a interaction ha should happen between a student and a teacher. And, but in reality, we can't interact without first determining someone's gender, 
And this is an unnoticed process because it's really involved in the activities and institutional roles that people enact together as they're interacting with each other. So gender categorization is vital in understanding this, right? In work encounters, it sets the stage for two different interactional processes that contribute to and help preserve gender inequality in paid employment. So the first is that gender categorization cues gender stereotypes that unconsciously shape people's assumptions about women's competence versus men's. And secondly, gender categorization unconsciously biases who people compare themselves to, which, you know, of course, ends up affecting the rewards that they feel that they are entitled to and the wages for which they'll end up settling. So when it comes to gender status beliefs, these are widely accepted cultural beliefs that men are generally superior and more competent than women. And this shapes our perceptions of each other. And remember, it's important to kind of, anytime we're talking about a specific uh, social identity, to remind everyone that we are very intersectional, right? We're not just our gender, we're our social class, we're our race, ethnicity, we're our sexuality, our age, our ability. So we're not just our gender in those interactions, right? We're also those other social statuses and hierarchies. So all of these things come into play when we're in interacting with each other. And so this means that while being a female may give someone less assumptions about credibility, white women are going to be considered more credible than women of color, as are rich women than poor women. So how much gender has uh, come to matter has to do with its salience or prominence of that situation. So our work-related identities are the central focus when we're at work, but gender often is acting as a background identity that shapes this, right? It shapes our interactions. So when gender matters is when it's seen as even more of a relevant factor. So in a, uh, you know, gender dominated job position, like either male or female, or maybe, um, you know, in those kind of situations, it becomes more prominent and it becomes more of a factor. So there's three effects on goal-oriented interaction that affect employment inequality. So the first being that men and women expect to be more, or men and women expect men to be more competent. So these implicit expectations tend to become self-fulfilling prophecies that shape men and women in their assertiveness and confidence in the situation, right? If someone expects you to do well, we've learned about self-fulfilling prophecies that that actually enables people, the, the social space to do better. So... This is going to affect, you know, if, if someone is more given more space to be confident and assertive, then they actually might perform better, right? Their judgments of other people's abilities are also colored by gender. And this affects the actual performance and their influence in the setting. Um, this also causes people, the second um, effect is that it causes people to expect and feel entitled to rewards relative to their status. So it just causes the assumption that men are more competent or important than, you know, um, than women in those situations. So both men and women assume this. This means they're also going to presume that men are entitled to more rewards and higher pay. So men may react negatively if they're placed on the same level as a similarly qualified woman and experience this as an implicit status threat. And third effect on goal-oriented interaction is that men are advantaged in interactions, making them less likely to notice or even to discount gender inequality when they do see it. And this is just a truism across the board. People's interest in a situation unconsciously biases what they perceive. So an example of this tendency to attribute interesting ideas with a male speaker, even if a woman was the first to bring them up, right? Um, there's a film I show in another class in my women's course um, called Makers, Women in Politics. And Nancy Pelosi talks about how when she first entered, um, you know, the Congress, that she had this experience of bringing up ideas or, you know, introducing, uh, you know, ideas to legislation and being completely ignored and then they would call in the next person and he would say literally exactly what she just said and they'd be like wow Bob what a great idea <laughs> right and so this is obviously a situation where if women are in a male dominated position such as politics and they are considered less competent less credible then it's easier to discount their ideas or even to usurp and take their ideas and place them as if they are men's ideas right so these women aren't rewarded for the idea the men are. And of course, in that situation, it's in your best interest to not notice the unfairness, <laughs> right? Like if someone says, hey, that was a great idea, you had. You're like, yeah, it was, certainly was. Even though it wasn't your idea, it's it's like in your own interest to not mention that, right? Or to ignore it. So if she asserts like, hey, that was my idea. And, uh, you know, like kind of is pushy about saying like, this is 
you know, hey, I, you know, we call it assertive in that situation is what we should use the word as, but we say pushy because that's the interpretation people have. That women should kind of know their place and not rock the boat in those kind of things. So if a woman, you know, says, hey, that's my idea, you're stealing my idea, she is considered out of line, not the person who's actually taking her ideas. So when it comes to gender uh, biased comparison and rewards, reward expectations become self-fulfilling. So in general, we look at other people similar in rank to us to make sure that we're being compensated fairly. But gender, of course, prejudices this. And so we tend to look at the other people in our job positions that are our same gender as our comparison point without necessarily realizing it. And as a result, that you know, women are comparing salaries with women, men are comparing salaries with men, women are gonna form lower expectations or entitlements to rewards than men who are doing the same comparisons. And these reward expectations become self-fulfilling and shape our sense of financial worth at work. So gender inequality in unemployment, you'd think that in a market-driven economy, employers would prefer women who are similarly qualified to men but expect less pay, as that's kind of a cheaper model for wages. Yet gender inequality in wages and really gender segregation of industries has persisted over decades and continues as it's continually being created anew, even if it loses the same power over time. So in work-related interactions, these take place within an organizational context with established job structures and institutional rules that constrain what happens. And of course, as much as it's supposed to be gender neutral, it often isn't interpreted that way, depending on the people in these interactions. So interactional gender processes become important in themselves at the spaces and organizations and under conditions that force change on an organization. So in these transition zones, these are where organizational structures are less clearly defined. And of course, gender categorization, your status and comparison practices are starting to shape the interactions through which people are acting and they create new organizational rules and structural forms that map gender hierarchy as they put them, you know, as they enact these kind of uh, interactions with each other. So this affects occupational arrangements and wage outcomes. So these are often mediated by work interactions. And if those are interactions that are being mediated through gender, then these are all potential sites where interactional mechanisms can map gender hier hierarchy into the occupational patterns and wages that result. So it's basically taking the older system and reifying them into new job positions in the present. So when it comes to the sex labeling of workers and jobs, gender inequality in employment begins with the gender labeling of workers. So the question she asks is, why are they gendered and not just employees? Why does it matter so much? Largely because it's an organizing principle, an interaction. So gender is infused into the hiring process as it mediates recruitment and placement of workers. So interactions in work environments can trigger gender categorization and this affects how employers read resumes, how they interact at work. All of those times, gender is a factor. So we label jobs as male or female occupations. As the economy changes, these jobs, the importance of them fade because new technological advancements bring new jobs. So theoretically, new fields would be gender neutral, but in reality, most are labeled male or female relatively quickly. When it comes to gender segregation in the workforce, the persistence of gender labeling and the segregated nature of our occupational structure reinforces this, right? So we tend to continually label gender label jobs, right? So gender categorization and workplace interactions plays a role in this continuation. So when we, labor, when we label different jobs by gender, we reinforce stereotypical assumptions about workers and employers. So the assumptions about labor costs are also affected by these gender beliefs. So employers and workers may use gendered stereotypes to justify activities in gender segregated jobs, even when those activities originally seem gender irrelevant. And so in this way, as expectations reflect the gender composition, jobs like electronics assembly become female work because it's associated with women's attention to detail and manual dexterity. While jobs like selling securities, right, those people you see in Wall Street yelling at each other, um, becomes a male profession as it requires aggressiveness, which is considered masculine. Though I think it's ironic because uh, my aunt uh, worked in securities for a lot of years, um, 
Selling securities for the stock market, though, the Canadian stock market, not the American stock market. And she is a fiery five foot one woman. Um, <laughs> but she's also like the loudest person I've ever known in my life. Like probably the one of the most aggressive in your face people ever. So the job totally works for her. But clearly it's not like a gender specific thing. It's just some people are, like my Aunt Mary, loud, right? And that makes sense. In a situation like that, that's a skill for jobs like that versus like my job at the library, she would not be welcomed there, right? <laughs> so anyway, um, you know, with these kind of the stories and the social scripts that represent jobs, not just in our personal lives, but also in the media and other sources, right? They come to be gendered as masculine or feminine. And the differential status that we attach to men and women in the culture spreads to the job itself. So research shows that when a job is labeled feminine, the assumption is that it requires less ability and less effort, therefore is worth less money and compensation. So gender compensation of a job has a significant impact on what it pays, as does the association of the job with stereotypical feminine tasks, such as being nurturing. So the more a job is considered feminine, the less pay tends to be associated with it. So when it comes to reinforcement, this continual gender categorization in workplace interactions reinforces the tendency to apply gender labels to activities and perpetuates gender-based evaluations of jobs and activities. So when it comes to men and women as the interested actors in the workplace, people in powerful positions, such as bosses, have more power to use that power that they have, right? They have much more power in the interactions in workplaces. Um, and of course, that power in the setting affects how then workers interact. So you know, when it comes to this idea that men tend to be bosses, especially in, in the highest up parts of, you know, companies and positions, this affects who's hired and promoted because they're the ones who get to determine those things. So this also affects how you're paid. If men and women tend to see men as more competent and more deserving of rewards than similarly qualified women, this may bias treatment as there's implicit and explicit ways this can happen. So this could be where a man may favor another man over a woman in hiring or promotion because of the assumption of worth, competence, or the fact that we feel more comfortable around people that are like us, right? So this is largely a subconscious bias and not done intentionally. While there are some more rare cases where men do act more self-consciously in order to preserve their interests as men, and this produces the result of acting on behalf of their gender, and sometimes this even happens for men that aren't like, you know, internet meninists or anything. These are people that have no specific loyalty to their gender, but their bias is coming from those gender stereotypes that assume that a man's going to be better suited for certain work positions. So when it comes to this idea, like in that same case, does that mean that women preference women? Maybe, but in the same sense that we prefer people like us, but women are also subject to stereotypes that say men are more competent. So they may also accept this social argument. Women may feel that the ideological bias against them is there like when these gendered ways, but largely they're powerless to really do anything about it because they're not in the positions of power. So employers often have preference for male workers, and this is a key factor in maintaining gender inequality in wages. According to research by Reskin and Ruse, good paying jobs have employers that show general preferences for male workers. The exception, of course, are jobs that are stereotypically associated with female roles, such as nurses or preschool teachers, because of the you know nurturing involved in that role, um, the, the gender stereotypes around that, they're considered to be women's work. So when it comes to expectations about competence and gender, the male you know um, worker often appear, uh, appears better to men and women, largely because of those uh, gender stereotypes. So even if they're compared to an equally qualified female worker, people may assume because of those bias issues that they are more competent, right? So um, this can lead to what's called error discrimination, where two workers can literally perform equally, but they're judged to be different and paid, uh, you know, differently according to that expectation of difference. So competence becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. And the pressures of low expectations for women can interfere with their work performance. Just as we saw in that kind of Pygmalion in the classroom research study about teachers and how that influences students, we can see that if your boss thinks you're an idiot or if your boss just doesn't think you're as competent as your coworkers, not only does that affect you know, the way that they then decide to either hire you, promote you, what they pay you, but that also affects how you feel at work. 
Like when you know someone thinks you're an idiot or you know like your dumb coworker, people assume that that person's more competent than you. <laughs> that's obviously going to make you feel less secure, right? Less competent, less confident. And that confidence comes back to actually performing better in the job. So it's almost that self-fulfilling prophecy because by saying that women are not as qualified for certain positions, you make them insecure in those positions. You treat them as if they're not as good in those positions. So it ends up actually becoming more realistic or more the truth in a self-fulfilling prophecy loop. So, um, and that just interferes with their work performances, right? So why do women workers accept lower wages? Part of this has to do how gender processes in interaction shape our senses of entitlement. This just means that similarly qualified men and women come to accept different amounts of money or, or compensation as normal, largely when we went back to that idea of who they're comparing themselves to, right? So women working in female-dominated positions are often still evaluated by male bosses, right? There's that concept of the glass escalator that we talk about. Um, where, you know, men in female dominated positions are often fast tracked to managerial positions. Um, this just means that women often, um, underestimate the quality of their performances in these interactions with men because of the, uh, the gender bias that they're facing. So this means that they're susceptible to arguments that they deserve less pay. And... These gender processes also shape who you compare your salary to, right? You may think the pay you're receiving is fair because you're comparing it to people that are in a similar position as you, but often the same gender. So that means that, you know, women are comparing with women, men are comparing with men. And as a result, you might not notice that there's a large gender discrepancy in what you're getting paid for the same positions. So women underestimate the rewards they're entitled to. Some employers can easily force them to settle for lower wages, and their unintentional acceptance of lower pay helps sustain gender hierarchy in, unemployment, or in this employment realm over time, right? So kind of reifying it, why, making it continue. And this just really affects, um, you know, what kind of compensation females feel that they're entitled to. So an example of this could be uh, Lily Ledbetter, right? She worked for Goodyear for many years, before someone anonymously told her that men that had worked there for less than half as long as she had in the same position were getting paid significantly more than she was. So she sued, and apparently the rules said at the time that you're only able to sue six months from the time that unequal pay starts, which is kind of insane because we do not know the pay of all the other people that we work with. Like I've literally been told in workplaces to not discuss my compensation Right, so after a lot of drama and struggle, the Lily Ledbetter Act was passed and signed by Obama, which says that now you have six months to file a complaint for the time you find out any equal treatment is happening. And since I'm afraid of getting uh, a copyright claim on the video for including it, I'm going to include that as an additional video um, for you know this week's module. So that you know, just so you can find out a little bit more information about what happened to Lily Ledbetter and um, you know, kind of the specific incident she experienced, which was really heartbreaking for her after she'd spent so many years of her life dedicated to this company to find out they were treating her so unfairly. So when it comes to women's entrance into male occupations, in recent years, women have entered more male occupations in large numbers. Yet, wage inequality and gender segregation of jobs has not declined as much as you would assume based on this fact. So it's part of the reason is that men tend to flee an occupation as soon as lots of women enter them. So an example of this could be the job of secretary, right, which was historically a male job. It had a higher status and position, kind of like what we think of as a personal assistant nowadays. Um, but as women entered more of those positions and, you know, because they were clerical typers, they could organize stuff, um, meant that they were cheaper and because they had less value. So therefore, um, not only did women take over this profession, but then the status and the pay of the job dropped as men left it. Another example they gave in the reading is the job of bank teller, which was also largely male profession and is now dominated by women. And you see that the rate of pay has dropped significantly since men have left this profession in, in large numbers. So there are certain ways um, that as women enter these fields, they still get gender segregated. So like medicine is an example 
where some specialties, like women have now entered medicine in general, that was a male field, but now even like the specific fields in medicine are becoming gendered, with much more women in pediatrics, while men tend to dominate fields like, you know, neurosurgery, right, stuff like that. So it is an improvement in overall in medicine, but there's still gender segregation going on within those kind of specialties of medicine, which is interesting to see. So when women enter male occupations, they often do it when the demand for workers in that occupation is higher than the pool of interested male workers that are available. So the shortage of men has a lot to do with this, right? It has to do with the fact that if there were enough men, those would be the people getting those positions. So that's largely what gives women the opportunities to move into these spaces. But in a lot of ways, um, women are subtly devalued in these interactions, right? Because they're considered less competent, um, they're considered of less value. So this obviously affects the kind of way that we then reify that gender segregation or justify women getting paid um, differently or receiving different rewards for the same kind of pay. So as women become no more numerous in the job, like we said before, oftentimes this changes the status and understanding of that job within the job market, right? If it's considered um, something that is, again, predominated by women, we often lose pay and status for those positions that were there before that when they were considered male professions. So you know, in, in general, what she's trying to say is if inequality is to be reduced, it's vital to understand that gender inequality is maintained by structural processes acting together. It's not enough to just say, okay, pay the same for the pay, same job. Okay, well, yeah, sure, that would help. But at the same time, you have a lot of gender segregation within job markets. So like, for example, if you work at a restaurant, there tends to be a gender difference between who's a host and who's a server, or sometimes who's in the front stage or who's in the backstage, meaning the people that are cooking in the kitchen are often male, the busboys, the people like that, versus the more servant, servile kind of, uh, you know, either server, hostess positions that are more attuned to gender stereotypes for women are filled by women. So there's a lot of this segregation even within specific occupations, right? Where um, if you go to the same place to get a job, the actual position that you're filled in um, can be different just ba based on this gender expectation. And again, these things tend to change and new technology comes about, um, you know, and it's kind of ironic because those things tend to be neutral, like, okay, a computer programmer, like there's no necessarily gender component to that, but we already have gendered that, right? We see like the Gamergate situation where women just trying to get into um, programming and, and especially uh, game programming has been met by fierce resistance from men on the internet that think that um, you know women have no place in these things or that just think that the world of video games is somehow male, which is ironic because over 40% of users are female when it comes to video games, like who's playing them, who's buying them. Um, so the assumption of the space, just like the internet itself, the assumption of the internet space is male, but in reality, of course, women use the internet. But the idea is that who has more power and influence in order to dictate what is done. Um, you know, there's a lot of harassment against people who tried and challenge these systems. Like Anita Sarkeesian, who um, is a media critic who has a lot of videos on, um, she calls it, I guess her, her blog's called Feminist Frequency. Um, but she basically tries to tackle some of these issues within, um, you know, a lot of like kind of like the tropes and memes and ways that we portray women within video game culture. And just, she's also saying you can love a media form, but also criticize it for its gender stereotypes and problems. But people have like, you know, had rape threats, death threats against her. She was trying to do a speech at a university and someone said that they were gonna come in and do a Mark Lapine, well, they signed it Mark Lapine, who is the name of the Montreal Massacre. Um, the guy in uh, like 1989 or somewhere in there um, in Canada that went into, a, um, a technical college where there was women that were engineers studying and he killed them all and then killed himself, uh, like 14 or more women somewhere in there, um, because he considered somehow feminism a challenge to his male status or dominance. He saw, you know, kind of that status threat we talked about when men are considered to be placed on the same level as equally competent women. We consider that, you know, um, you know, men can consider that a status threat. Like, even if they are in the same position, they have the same qualifications, they still feel more entitlement to higher pay, to more rewards, 
to more space and opportunity for power. And that's something that's not just stuck into these institutional contexts of work. Well, obviously, the institutional context of work with its hierarchical nature, you know, the fact that there's bosses have power over their workers and like workers often have power over more subordinate workers or some fields within a work career are valued over others means that there's more space to let this gender inequality kind of imbue itself within the institutional processes of work, whether it's in the resume process, right, which we know that um, studies have been doing this for years where they send the equal resume, equal qualifications, and they find that, you know, and this has been replicated over 30 years, women still are disqualified from a lot of potential job openings um, based on having the literal same credentials as men. Those men are seen as more competent, right? Um, actually, there's also another thing I, I'm going to either include in the additional resources or the module for this week. There's an interesting story of late from a, um, basically this guy wrote the story about how he thought that his female coworker wasn't getting as much work done as he was. And he kind of saw it as like an entitlement thing. Like I should get more pay and I should get more rewards because, you know, I'm doing more work than she is. But then there was this weird hiccup where accidentally his email, like, like someone hadn't logged off basically, like he sent something to a client and it had her name at the bottom of the email instead of his. And it's a client that he dealt with all the time and had like no problems with. And all of a sudden this person had a ton of challenges and issues with his design. So he decided to try it as an experiment just for like a couple days to try to, you know, just basically do the same work duties that he was always doing, but just signing the email as her instead of as himself. And he let her do it as him, right? And what he found was that um, she got all her work done in a fraction of the time that it normally took her because she had to spend so much of her time justifying that she even knew what the hell she was talking about, which is something that him with his male privilege, he had never had to actually experience until he accidentally used her email sign off and then realized that that was really the major difference and why he was actually outproducing her in a lot of ways is because he didn't have to keep, you know, basically convincing the customers that, his way was worthwhile. So I think I'll include that information as well, just for as a reference to kind of back up some of the stuff that she's talking about in this article. Obviously, there's so much data when it comes to uh, labor force statistics that talks about the persistence of these things in pay gaps. Um, but largely, this has become like a weird politicized issue where people just kind of discount the idea of gender inequality at all, while simultaneously reinforcing it, which is like kind of the most ironic part of it, right? So clearly, if we really want to reduce this inequality, if we really want to make it so that people are based, you know, they're judged on their merits, not their gender, then we have to be more cognizant of how these processes work and see how they've made their way into all sorts of processes of, the, of whether it's recruitment, whether it's hiring, whether it's placement in a job, whether it's then retention or promotion or, you know, pay raises, things like that that all of these things are being affected by those gendered processes.